right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 82, John 14. And, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, I am super thankful that the Lord has brought uh, these men from all over the United States to help pour into Revive School. You know, yesterday we had Ryan Schrag. Tomorrow you're going to have Matt Reynolds. These are guys that have been pouring into cities, pouring into communities with the gospel. And now they get to deliver and teach through the Word of God. And you know, really what it does for me is it allows me to, to breathe. And guys, it's been fun to bring in different folks. In fact, we have a new guy here in the studio. He, he's not hes not teaching right now. He could, but we have Sean Carlson. Sean, how you doing back there? I'm good so far. <laughs> <laughs> Sean is running the switcher because I, I'm just going to talk practicality, you guys, because we're doing this every single day. There are times that not everybody can be here. I mean, Rich gets to send his son off in marriage. You know, Kevin gets to take off on a, on a trip. Or Jeff is, you know, <laughs> Jeff. Jeff is going all over the place. I was just thinking, Jeff's headed to Indiana. You know, we just have TJ serving in the military. So as a result of just life, we still need to keep going through the Word of God every day. And so the Lord is just gracious enough to bring us Sean. <laughs> to fill in the gaps and run switch. So not only is he answer phones, but now he's switching buttons. Sean, thanks for thanks for being here today. Uh-huh. Uh, you've actually talked more than Rich right now at times. So thank you. So you know, here's the deal. In uh, John 13, I, I'll just tell you this. It, it takes a whole, what is the saying? It takes a tribe to raise up a family or to, to bring up a family. And that's really the case for Revive School. Like we're learning more and more. We cannot do this on our own. <laughs> In fact, it, it'll kill us, uh, literally, and um, like it can't. And so we need as much help as we can. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that I want to reference from what Ryan said, things I want to transition to John 14. But Reno Ryan was talking in John 13, and at the very end, didn't quite get to everything. Uh, it, it's hard to cram in, <laughs> isn't it this? And it's kind of fun to watch these guys, isn't it? They're like trying to fit a whole chapter into this. It, it, it doesn't work. Remember we, in the Old Testament, we try to do three chapters? You're like, what were we even thinking right there? And so anyway, at the end of John 13, here's the deal. Jesus is, is communicating. Oh, by the way, there's going to be a traitor amongst us. There's going to be a guy who's actually going to betray us. And so things are beginning to like, if, if I'm, if I'm going to hear all of a sudden that Kevin is the bad guy in this group, and that eventually he's going he's gonna to sabotage all of this stuff, like your hearts would be troubled. Like, or, you know, imagine if Kevin didn't bring in pretzel, peanut butter pretzels, you know, these things like our hearts would be bothered. Tom, am I right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So You're ready bothered. to betray you guys. No, Kevin, no, don't. Okay, but imagine though if they, Jesus said somebody's going to betray me. Okay, so I want you to think through this process. Then imagine if Jesus says all of a sudden to Jeff, hey, Jeff, by the way, you're going to betray Jesus three times. I don't know why you guys are my example. Sorry right now. Stinks. And so <laughs> Kevin's going to betray us and then you're going to deny Christ three times. So this whole group, as we're hearing all this, we're kind of like, um, I don't like this. And then it gets even worse. And then the next thing you know, Jesus says to all of us, hey, by the way, as Kevin is doing this, as Jeff is doing this, I'm, I'm out of here. And Jesus says, I'm leaving. So imagine this is the news at the end of John 13. The reason you have to say this news is because it's bad news in some, res in some respects. Now, Jesus is leaving is not. But because of that, like there comes and creates this confusion. And so your hearts are literally troubled. Everybody's going this way. Somebody's going that way. And you're like, what is happening right now? And in fact, John 13, 36, Peter says, hey, where are you going, Lord? Where are you going? And so there's this mentality. <laughs> there's this mentality of like, man, I just, I don't know what's going on anymore. Like, have you ever gotten to that point in your life? You know, I think all of us have at some point. And so I want to talk about the heart issue. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus knows the disciples are bothered. He knows like, hey, guys, I understand I just said what I said. But in John 14, verse 1, Kevin, if you'll go there, please. The scripture just says, your heart must not be troubled. Okay, so here's what I want to do. Their hearts are troubled because of all of this news, but yet Jesus gives us some promise. He gives us this direction. And so what I want to do is, and I love what Warren, Warren Wearsby, I think, has the best prescription. In some regards, I feel like I'm almost talking uh, the Gospel of Luke, almost Dr. Luke mentality, because I'm going to give you a prescription from Warren Wearsby, and this is what I love, on how you cannot let your hearts or how to prevent your hearts from getting troubled. 
that make sense? So when you're going through life and all of this, like my friends are leaving, this is chaos, Jesus, where are you? Warren Wearsby gives this breakdown in John 14, and then we're gonna throw in there another I am. Okay, so in all of this, this is the best part. He gives you saying, I, I know how to, you to get through life. Now, I'm just gonna tell you right now, I'm not the greatest at this. I, I'm not the greatest at this. I'm not the greatest at letting my heart not be troubled. I don't know if it's the, the Peters that deny Christ or, you know, uh, the Judas that's betraying or Jesus is leaving. I don't know what your scenario is that's creating your heart to be troubled. But I want to give you, and it's what Wearsby unfolds all throughout John 14. I want to give you the process to fight that. I don't want you to get to the point where you're on a second floor of a hospital in a gown and like it's super awkward, the television reception's bad, the food's not so great, you know? I mean, like you're processing all of these things. However, you can order double portions at the hospital and nobody questions anything. It's awesome. <laughs> it is great, you know? And all of these things, and I just, I wanna prevent you to get to this point. And as I was studying this, I just felt like the Lord just said, you know, share this, Kyle. Be honest and be real with people. And so in verse one, he says, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So just that fact alone that he says, believe in God and believe also in me, what is he equating? He's the son of God. He is God. So just by saying that in itself, don't let your heart be troubled. Just first of all, believe in me. That's what he's saying here. And then he says this in verse two, in my father's house. <laughs> you cannot say that verse without wanting to sing it. Jeff, that was your cue. It's a big, big house <laughs> with lots and lots of room. And what can you do there? You can play football. football. <laughs> That's right. And there's something else. It's a big, big table yeah. with lots and lots of food. <laughs> All right, so this is the In My Father's House. Uh, Tom, you're up for the next quarter, so get ready. So In My Father's House, So one of the ways that you can understand that your heart is not going to be troubled. Let's just state, these are all obvious, you guys. Believe in God, believe in also in me, which means you have salvation, which ultimately means, okay, you ready? You are, you're going to heaven. I mean, that fact alone is the best thing ever. You have a home in heaven. You have a home in the Father's house with lots and lots of rooms, right? You have, a, a, it's, it's a dwelling place. And if not, I would have told you, I'm going, remember Jesus said, I'm going, a way to prepare a place for you. Now, this heaven, okay, let's not play a game, let's be real. When we talk about hell, a lot of people play the game, oh, it's not real. How many times have we talked about this? You know, and, and remember the rich man and Lazarus, he's like, dear Lord, please just drop a water drip on me. I need something. You want to know why? Because hell is hot. It burns and nobody wants to be there. But now on the flip side, if hell is real, heaven definitely is real. And so what he's saying here very simply is, I am going to prepare a place. And I love what Wearsby says here. Heaven is not a product of some religious imagination. Okay? Heaven is not some psyched up mentality. It's not this new agey, hey, bro. I think that was more somebody on drugs, actually. Uh, it, heaven is not this looking up for a pie in the sky. No, heaven is where our Father dwells. Heaven is where Jesus sits at the right hand and he intercedes on your behalf, on my behalf. That fact alone should take care of your heart troubles. Oh yeah, Jesus knows, Kyle, that kid's got some issues. I'm praying for him. Like that fact alone should allow us to our heart be like, yes, it's real place. It has a real location. And I love what Weirdsby says. It's a loving place. It's an exclusive place, which means not everybody has a membership to heaven. Not everybody. And I know people are like, oh, I don't like that phrase. It's okay. Get over it for a second. Not everybody has a ticket to heaven. Not everybody is going to get into heaven. Only those who put their trust in Christ. Only those who believe in the death burial and resurrection, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, only those who believe that Christ is our Messiah, those are the ones who are going to say, yes, I'm getting into heaven. Acts 4, verse 12, if you'll go there, Kevin. So this first fact, and this is a fact, okay? It's a faithful fact, <laughs> strangely enough. Watch this. It just says 412, if you would, Kevin. 
It says, there is salvation in no one else. Only through Christ. And this is important to understand as we get into John 14, 6. There's no other name under heaven given to people and we must be saved by the name of Christ. And when we have this salvation in Christ, we got a place in heaven. I can't wait. And yet it's a weird thing to think about, isn't it? Like, I'm going to be there forever. What am I going to do there? Like, do you think those things sometimes? Like, yeah, we're going to play football and eat lots and lots of food and a big, big table, right? Those are the kind of things. But like, you guys, we got to understand something. This is an incredible place. But heaven, okay, and I know time-wise, we're just going to see how this works. Heaven is also it's a, it's a kingdom. 2 Peter 1, 11. You're going to heaven because it's a kingdom. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior will be richly supplied to you. Man, you're going to get a kingdom. Praise God. First Peter 1, 4, scripture says, oh, by the way, heaven is an inheritance. So it's a kingdom. It's an inheritance. And it says in first Peter 1, 4, and into an inheritance. Ready for this? It's imperishable. It's uncorrupted and it's unfading and it's kept in heaven for you. Yes, like this is what I want. This right here should keep your heart ticking. This is the things that say, I'll take away your troubles if you focus on spending time with me. Hebrews 11, verse 16, it's in reference to two things, a country and a city. By they now, but they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then finally, just again in John 14, 2, to bring it all back, it's a home. Heaven is a home. And I, I love this. It's a house. Uh, a London newspaper at one point, Wearsby Report says this. They took a survey of if you could define home. Like when you think of heaven, like it, it should be the best place that you should be. It should be the place you feel most comfortable. And they took this survey and they said, home is the place where you are treated the best and you complain the most. It's kind of true. You're like, oh, I love this place. I can't believe this place, <laughs> you know? It's so like you just kind of vent. I don't think you're gonna be venting a whole lot in heaven. But I think the point is, is you can just, you can just sit down, put your feet up and be like, yes. Robert Frost, uh, I can't believe I'm even quoting Robert Frost. Uh, that's for you, Sean. Uh, it makes me feel a little bit more smarter right now. Home is a place, okay, that, that when you arrive there, <laughs> they have to take you in. <laughs> I like that because in heaven, if you have the blood of Christ on you, they have to take you in. The Father says, welcome. And so, first of all, you guys, in order for your heart to work through times that are troubling, when you're sitting in a hospital, in order to get through all that stuff because of finances, like, Lord, how am I going to do this? Focus on the eternal. That, that's what he's after, you guys. And so, all right, let's, let's continue to work through this process, okay? And it's kind of fun, Kevin, if we can. And verse 3 says, if I go away and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and I'll receive you to myself. So that where I am, you may be also. Now look, one of the number one things for Time Revive or Revive School is that our job is to prepare you, you ready for this? For the return of Christ. So he says, if I'm going to go and prepare a place, which is where he's now, true, right? He is sitting out, he's hanging out in heaven. As he's sitting there, what does it say he's going to do? Kevin? He's going to come back. He's coming back. And we know in Acts 1.8, it says, as he left, or in Acts 1, excuse me, as he left, he's coming back. And we know even in Daniel 12, the son of man, right? Daniel 7, Daniel 7 or Daniel 12, can't remember is that he is going to come back on the cloud the way he left. And so I, I, I love this image. Thanks, Kevin. Daniel 7, I continued watching the night visions and I saw one like the Son of Man coming with the cloud, clouds of heaven. Like this is what we're talking about. This is what we're waiting. This is what I want you to get ready for. He is coming back. He says in verse 4, you know, I'm in John uh, 14, you know the way to where I'm going. Let's be real, though. If I'm a disciple hanging out with Jesus, I probably would have said the same thing as Thomas. Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> We've been everywhere with you. Are you kidding me? Are we going to Bethany? Are we going to Jericho? Where, where are you going? And how can we know the way? I'm, I'm sorry. 
that can you can you go back to verse three? <laughs> he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place. Where's that? Go back to verse two. My father's house. Where's that? Like this is language. No offense. If we heard this, heard this, we'd be like, ah, uh, I'm not getting this on my ways. <laughs> going to Nazareth? I'm not getting. Yeah, I mean, where are you going? And yet, strangely enough, this same Thomas in John 11. Remember, we talked about this. He had this radical desire to go with Jesus into Jerusalem. And say, I'll die for you. I love the emotions of the disciples. We're so like them. We're so emotionally unstable at times. Oh yeah! Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know, it's that mentality that we have. And so Jesus, I love this. Ready? Da 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 da. Here we go. We have another I am. John 14:6. There's seven of them. Tom, tomorrow we'll get to the seventh one. Okay? Just FYI. So we have the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, rich. This is the what did Rich just call that one? The, the gate. The gate. Yeah, the door of the sheep. Uh, we have the the resurrection and the life. Uh, tomorrow you're going to get into the true vine, but the best one is is not the best one. It's the one we're talking about today. Okay, he says, "I am." The context of verse six is, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." He's talking about who did who just asked him a question? Thomas. Hey, where are you going? I don't know where you're going. I don't even know how to get there. And so he says, "Oh, I'll, I'll tell you." I'll give you the roadmap. I'll give you the game plan for your heart not to be troubled. I'm going to tell you, and it's going to come through one verse. He says, "I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life." What I love about Mindy's picture right here is think about this. It's the truth, right? That it somehow it, it emphasizes the way. Now I said this this last week. I'm going to keep saying this over and over again. Here's what I think we do in the American church. I think we pick apart verse six, and I think we pick the ones that we like. We like the truth. We're okay with the truth. We're okay with Jesus being the Word. And oh man, we love the resurrection and the life. We love the fact that Jesus says, "I have a home for you, not only in eternity, but I'm going to change your life right now." I think we like those things. But man, when He asks us to follow the narrow path, when He asks us to To follow the little dirt path that nobody wants to take, and in fact, it's a path that you can't even describe. I was on the phone this morning, and somebody was asking me about this. He goes, "I don't even know how to describe sometimes when you walk by faith. I, like, I don't even get that. I know I do. I don't. I don't either. I just know this is the path he's asking me to take." And Jesus says, "You follow me on this way." You base everything on the Word of God, and I promise you, I will give you life. But just so you know, the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Nobody gets around over here to the Father unless it comes through the Word of God. Unless it comes through Christ, nobody. Oh, that's so judgmental, you Christians. That's so exclusive. How dare you think that you're only the way? Yes, it is. Get over it. It's not judgmental. It's truth. And I think what's happened in the American church is that we become so politically correct with our neighbors or other religions. We're afraid to actually tell them the truth. You guys, if we don't tell them the truth, their hearts will always be troubled, and they'll never have a place in heaven. That's the reality of John fourteen six. How much do we, as, as Penn and Teller said, how much do we have to hate the lost to not tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life? Let them decide, but at least we have to give them that option. And Jesus says, "I am it." In fact, Kevin, we just read this in Acts. Do we not? Acts four twelve. Salvation only comes through Christ. There's nobody else. And for some reason, it, it's almost like. Every three years, we keep playing this weird game. Oh, yeah, you know, it, it, you don't need to talk about Jesus. Let's give more room for uh, the Muslims. Let's give more room for the Buddhists. Let's give more room for you know other faiths. Or hey, here's a here's a room for the atheists, and here's a room for the agnostics. And so then we begin to invite and welcome everybody, yes, to the table. But then you have to tell them he's the way, the truth, and the life. We got to stop playing this game about pleasing everybody. So there's a sake of unity. Christ is it, and because He said He's it, guess what? Everybody kind of gets rubbed the wrong way. And what we've seen in John seven is when He introduced the Spirit of God that's inside each one of us, and it only comes through Him. 
And when you begin to do that, the religious, it begins to be like, hey, I don't, I don't like what this Jesus is saying. And Jesus said, look, here's the bottom line. I'm all you have. In order to overcome any of your heart situations, your life situations, your financial situations, your marriage situations, your parenting situations, just life, you come to me. And don't just embrace it as truth. Don't just say it because I want eternal life. You follow me. I am the way. I mean, the earlier followers, the earliest, the earliest followers of Christ were known as followers of the way. Like that's, imagine if we weren't known as the church, the ecclesia, just imagine if we were known as the way. I go back to my donut analogy. You know, I wish that every church, all it said was just church. And that you know you could go to any church and walk in and get the word of God and instead not your agendas and not your opinions. Wouldn't that be awesome if there was no Methodists or, or no Baptists or no Charismatics? It would just be the way. Followers of the way. You know what would happen? People would begin to say, hey, that, that path actually looks similar. It's the same path I've been hearing about every church I go to. You know, Scripture continues on in verse, verse 7. <laughs> uh, how do you not let your hearts get troubled? Well, Wearsby says this, You know the Father, this is really cool to me, right now. You know, I think sometimes people say, uh, well, Christians aren't any good because... <laughs> All they're doing is waiting for eternity, so they don't do anything here. In verses 7 through 11, no, 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 that's not the game we're supposed to play. Life says, if you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him, and we have seen him. Like, you can experience the Father right now. You don't have to wait to experience that into eternal state. In verse 8, Lord, Philip said, show us the Father. <laughs> well, at least it's now it's not Thomas, now it's Philip. Show us the Father and that, that's, that's enough. You just show us God and that's enough for us. Yeah, are you kidding me? No kidding. In verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been among you all this time without you knowing me, Philip? The one, who you, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. I am a part of the Father. I'm the Son of God. Show us the Father. How can you say that? And in verse 10, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Remember, you guys, we talked about this in John 5. Who testifies on behalf of Christ? John the Baptist, the scriptures, and so do his works, and so does the Father. When you begin to understand this language, it just pops out all the time in the Gospel of John. And in verse 11, he just says, Hey, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works uh, because of the works themselves. So two ways to take care of your hearts that's troubled. You are going to heaven because of who you are in Christ and you know the Father right now. Now because of, uh, of time, I'm going to kind of just start giving you some, some lines here. In verses 12 through uh, 15, what Wearsby says is, you know how you can not let your heart get troubled? You have the privilege. This is such a great line. Privilege. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, my point is, uh, SP, you have the privilege of prayer. Man, I need it right now. Okay, so anyway, no, this is what I love about this, you guys, the privilege of prayer. Think about this, okay? Uh, I, I'm not going to read this because 12, 13, uh, 14, and 15, it's talking about whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. You can come to me and talk, right? You can, because your heart is troubled, you have access at any time to get on your knees and come and pray to me. And there's a great, there's a great little, uh, a little plaque that Wearsby talks about. And he says, why, why pray when you can worry? I think some of the reasons we have problems with our heart is we do that. Why, why would we pray when I can, I can worry today? Praise God. <laughs> no, man, you have the privilege of coming before the almighty God in humility, in confidence, as it says in Hebrews, because of what Christ has done. We have the privilege of prayer. Continues on because of time here. I'm just going to give you the fourth one here. 
Uh, by the way, in verse 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He's giving you the Holy Spirit in verse 17. He reiterates that, and he says he is the Spirit of truth. So how do you work through your heart being troubled? You recognize we have the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to just say one thing about the Holy Spirit, okay? This is really, really important. The Comforter. Sometimes we think of the Comforter as a blanket. Oh, I love the blanket. It's warm. You can even plug one of those in and then it's really warm. I want you to think of it differently. I want you to think of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. I'm not calling the Holy Spirit an it. The Comforter, I want you to think of, as Wearsby says, this Comforter strengthens us to, to face life bravely and keep on going. It's like the strengthening of like, it's like this, yes, I, I, can, I can do this. As I'm laying in the hospital bed, I began to find strength in the Holy Spirit saying, Kyle, you can face life. Let's go. It's not just staying in the hospital bed saying, oh, thank you. It's no, I have more for you. And it comes from the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth will never contradict Jesus. You should never be afraid to face the world because the spirit of God will always take you to the truth to lead you down the way. It's an awesome picture. Now, at the same time, number five, okay, Wearsby says this, not only do you have the Holy Spirit, but we enjoy the Father's love. In verses 19 through 24. So we enjoy the Father's love. I mean, think about this. It just says uh, multiple verses here in this regard. Uh, let's jump to Kevin if we can. Uh, verse 23, Jesus answered, If anybody loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Oh, man, I wish I had time. I just want to give you the prescription. Right? This is how you can help your heart be, uh, not be troubled. And then finally, the very last thing to wrap up John 14 is this is one of my favorites, you guys. You have, I have, we all have um, his gift, Jesus's gift of peace. Verses 25 through 31. All I can say is this, is that when you put your trust in him, verse 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. When your heart is troubled, your buddies are leaving, life is coming at you hard, like it, it's just, it's hard. He says, your heart, look at this you guys, I do not give to you as the world gives, your heart must not be troubled or fearful because that peace, it comes from Christ. He'll put the peace on your mind, he'll put the peace on your heart. You gotta realize though that you have it. You have the peace. So, this is how you, <laughs> you ready? This is how you help all of this. This is how you help your heart. Down in John 14. Thanks for uh, jumping in with us, you guys. There's a lot here, so much to unpack. Uh, but I uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow.